Welcome back to Let's Play Pillars of Eternity, where we are here. In the nearby constellation, you can make out a shape of a strange warm beast. From time to time, you think you sense a faint chill emanating from the shrine itself. Nothing happens when you approach Wodeka Shrine. Before the shrine sits the constellation of a snarling howl, Fang, Hound, Fangs, Baird. Leave. Okay, you only get the experience once. Well, Deca won't answer. The shrine sits before a bright constellation, its stars forming the oval shape of an egg. The pair, a pair of wings sprout from the egg, stretching out to either side. Oh, I see that. There's the Hound. There's Wodeka. Glittering stars of the open of near con constellation, you see the grim shape of a skull. Its light jaws are open wide as if frozen to silent screen. A piercing ring fills your ear as you near whale shrine. There is no other response. Can't I pray to Yothas? I think Bareth might be the best because pray to Bareth. All things can be reforged. No, there's life and death, death and life. There's a rippling shift in the air around you as if some Unfelt wind has changed, bringing you unexpected warmth. You feel the particular weight of an unseen presence and of eyes upon you. You kneel and pray to bear off, even while your eyes are closed. You see a road that seems to stretch on forever. The stars wheel overhead in clockwork rotation of constellations, disappearing over the horizon to your left, only to rise to your right. You try to make out the details on either side of the road, but your eyes cannot seem to focus. One moment you think you see a meadow blanketed with mist and another, sh and another sheer canyon walls. For just an instant you see waves lapping at the edges of the road. Were you to step into the shifting landscape, you feel certain you would only end up back on the road. You know this is a vision, but the packed dirt feels firm beneath your feet and the night air cool on your face. You are walking. Your feet seem to carry you forward of their own accord. Something looms ahead of you. As you get closer, you see two stone figures that look strangely. Two of the oldest representations of Bera. You remember the door to Cleoben Relag and the two figures carved in the mountain next to it. One looks vaguely male and the other vaguely female. Only a thin layer of flesh covers their skeletal bodies, which twist to face the doorway with between them. The doorway, however, is not what you saw in the ruins. It's a skull, gaping and jawless, and as you look, its open mouth seems to grow. The arms of the two stone sculptures are swept toward the mouth. Fighting I'm going to go in. The road continues through the maw to another shifting landscape surrounded by stars. As you pass through it, you see an identical doorway in the distance. A dwarven man steers near it, unmoving. You turn and look behind you, and only to see the skull gate you just passed facing you. An elder woman waits by the road. Like the dwarf, she stands still. Hmm. Do I go to the woman or the man? Is going to the woman going back? Let's go to the woman. You start toward, toward her. There's something unnatural about the way she stands. She's too still. When you clo get closer, you see her legs taper into a slender trunk. In place of her feet are gnarled, twisting roots. She lifts her face to an invisible sun. Her long golden hair is the color of autumn leaves. As you look close, you realize her head is actually covered with tendrils and vines sprouting yellow leaves. Each glimmers with the essence of an entire soul. She gives you a beatific smile, and as you look on, the leaves slowly fall from her head and settle at her roots. They melt into the path beneath her, and almost immediately new leaves sprout 
in the place of Yol. She reaches toward you, still smiling as roots spring from her fingertips. She outstretched arms bear the part of the path. Come, graft your soul to the grove in Golden Grove. Take her hand. Roots twine around your fingers. As they do, they grow rigid and cold. Her outstretched arm petrifies, and as a rough stone bark overtakes her flesh, she can only look on in horror. You break away from her brittle grasp. Her feet are rooted in place, but she twists and rises as if to, trying to flee her own dying limb. The petrification reaches her shoulder and spreads down her body, freezing it in a painful arc. It creeps up her neck, and she throws her eyes sky face skyward like a drowning swimmer. The grayness covers her face, freezing her gasp in stone. Now that she is still and lifeless, you can continue past her. Only the golden leaves of her head remain untouched, and as you watch, they fall one by one to the path below. As they shrivel as the shimmering essence fades from them, you lift your gaze and see the dwarven man standing further down the road. You continue down the road toward him. He looks up at you as you approach, but you can't tell if he's looking at you or through you. His face is smooth but flaccid, as if the flesh has detached from the muscles underneath. As you look on, his face begins to change. Wrinkles crack at the corners of his eyes. His mouth stink, sinks, carving deeper, deep lines from his nose to the corners of his lips. His jowls sag, and the loose flesh hangs like dough. He raises his cupped hands. They are covered in blood. He lifts them to his face, smears himself from his newly creased forehead to the waddles of his neck. As he mass massages the dark, sticky fluid into his skin, the fresh wrinkles disappear. The hanging folds recede, and his flesh tightens as if re-adhering to his skull. Oh, okay, he lifts his head, and this time you know he's looking at you. His renewed face looks like a mask, artificially smooth and still. Behind it, black eye, his black eyes are two hungry pits, yawning like the empty mouths and skulls. Come, make your sacrifice to Ethic Null. His body blocks the path. He extends a bloody hand towards you. Take his hand. You grab his hand, and his skin gives too easily under your grip. As you try to pull away, you hear a noise like dried canvas tearing. His skin splits, following a long seam that begins at his arm and stretches the length of his body. Blood gushes forth in such quantities that you can't imagine there was ever anything else in him. Sure enough, as the dwarf empties of blood, he collapses like a desiccated husk. The blood in the, in the path gleams with a thousand souls worth of essence. The essence evaporates, trailing shining filaments into the night sky. Only now that he is dead can you continue onward. The blood pools around your feet, and the voice echoes along the road, barely more than a whisper on the breeze. You return them to the wheel. You look up and see the skull gate ahead of you. The candles of Tear Evron wink through the open mouth. In the lies the two figures from Barov's vision. Oh, bloody hell. Would this be better? Live every night note of life's song. The words seem to ring in the air, your voice rendered melodic and lifting by some unseen heart. You shut your eyes to pray. As you white and darkness, the world around you changes. You feel sunlight, bright and warm on your face. A light breeze carries music to your ears. As vivid as these sensations feel, you somehow know they are not real. You look around and find yourself standing in an open-air temple built on a mountain summit. It's filled with elves, orlands, and other assorted kith. Bringing the entire scene is a fringe of trees. There are verdant branches filled with birds of all different colors, shapes, and sizes. A paradise for those who would waste their lives, explore the meaningless while corrupting the meaning of the real world. Oh, to set these trees ablaze, Watcher. Everyone is singularly absorbed in a particular pursuit, and Orland sits with canvas, a paintbrush in his hands, and jars of green, blue, and yellow pigments at his feet. An elf and an Almua sitting, standing to the side, are locked in conversation, their expression dancing with delight. Still others scribble stanzas of poetry and crude sketches, or crude sketches of sheafs on paper. Losing themselves in the delicate minutiae of lines and syllables, you feel the brief breeze again, and two elves basking in the sunlight shiver. The largest group gathers in the middle of the temple. They sing a lush, chaotic harmony composed of several complementary melodies. Others drift, 
for the singers in ones and twos as if buffeted by a gust of wind on a phrase of the song. A ripple passes, passes through the trees. You think it's the wind, but the chirping changes to a screeching. Hundreds of birds take to the skies, all headed in one direction, away. Gervais submits a series of chirping bird calls as the flex rambles into the air. This is bad. Something has been spooked, but they won't tell me what. Then again, I, mis I think I mispronounced my bird song and probably called them incontinent. Then his face turns sour. The Votis glance at the trees. They barely destroy just barely distracted from their activities, but the wind picks up, scattering their pages of poetry and art, ripping the songs from their lips. They look skyward and follow their gaze. A dark shite blots out the sun. You can't tell what it is, but as it unfolds and expands, it seems to fill the sky. The wind roars over the summit. That explains the birds. Before you can flee, the shadow falls over the temple. It begins as a stain in the corner and spreads, blotting out the flagstones. It reaches the nearest camp of Blackbird Orla. The darkness swallows her, leaving only a puff of smoke in her place. The two elves that you saw earlier, man and woman, flee. You get a brief image of them huddled in the shadow of the mountain. They seem to see you, too, and they reach out, calling silently after you. The others, however, seem frozen. As the shadow advances, they likewise vanish one by one, the driving yell scattering their ashes and the charred remains of their creations. Songs of joy turn to screams of agony. What purpose? What lesson could possibly lie behind such destruction? You look up again at the source of the shadow, but the eclipsed sun forms a blinding corona around the thing. You can't make out any details. You can, however, feel heat. Restore my temple. You look down and find yourself standing next to Hylia Shrine in Tierra Evron. Your pulse still racing. Your skin is damp with sweat from your strange encounter. I'm beginning to wonder if all of these are necessary or just one is necessary. Okay, Galloway. Pray to Galloway. What is an answer without a question? Your words seem to fade once voice as if they were cast into a vast emptiness. The hall grows de deathly still inside, and then the ground starts to tremble beneath your feet. Oops. That was a mistake. I, I said the wrong one. I said whales. Okay. A gift if the ale. That's not very helpful. That's not very. Blast! Well. Afraid to close your eyes, Watcher? Not all of us are on such bad terms with sleep. Yay, okay. That was painful. Okay. I am going to take all of these. I'll start with the two I haven't already done that I just screwed up on. Or is it three that I haven't already done and just one of which I just screwed up on? I think it's two. Yeah. When an attack scores a hit, it does standard damage and has standard duration. A graze scores dam reduces damage and duration by 50%. A crit increases damage and duration by 50%. So now we know what happens when you get things wrong. Okay. Certainly. Hmm? This again. This place is one where a spirit may hear itself. Interesting. Pray to Galloway. That's okay. Abaddon, Barath. Survival begins with strength from within. 
air around you stirs and a gust of warm wind blows across the back of your neck you catch the faintest smell of wet earth as you kneel in front of the shrine you feel yourself pushed forward you catch yourself on your hands and knees feeling warm damp ground beneath them looking forward you find yourself crouched in a clearing in the middle of the road the woods in the smell the smell of the dirt hangs heavy in the air behind you is a darkened room built with candlelit shrines Ahead you hear the howl of some kind of howl. You feel certain this is a vision, but the hairs on the nape of your neck still rise. Oh, the scent of sweat, fur, loam, leaves, the discordant howls. I believe Galloway's herald approaches. Rivers breathes in deeply, his eyes closed, his eye closed, and his head dipped back as he smells. His eye opens as a smile settles across his face, his voice becomes equal parts of excitement and dread. How back? The beast bays in response, its voice high and clear. The thick, thick undergrowth shivers with movement and heavy paws pound the wet grass. You're not certain the creature is hunting or leading you, but you instinctively get chased. As you tumble through the dew spectacled bushes and plowing, clawing brambles, each stride feels longer than the last. You draw lungfuls of crisp, clear air and feel your energy renewed. The rhythm of your stride and the thumping of the beast's paws drive the blood thrumming into your ears. You speed ahead, following the hound's cries, when a split finger pine crashes to the ground in front of you. A massive bear lunges into the gap and roars. It catches sight of you. You turn and race in the opposite direction, leaping over the fallen tree trunk. Pine cones crunch underfoot. The bear lumbers after you. Its hot breath washes over the back of your neck, filling your nose with the rank odor of slaughter. You see a clearing that just passed a thicket of broad leaves and sprint toward it. As you break through the foliage, you see a massive lion that's curled up in the clearing in front of you. The last burst of energy, you divert your momentum and hurl yourself into the bushes. Any second now, you expect to feel the bear fall upon you, but a furious roar on the other side of the clearing draws your attention. The bear has stopped at the tree line. It swipes at the empty air with claws large enough to rend armor, but it does not advance. The lion is, for her part, twists her body into a tight coil. She growls. Her ears pressed against her head, but she makes no move to attack the intruder. Whose idea was it to stand here? You back deeper into the foliage, keeping your hands, eyes on the two mighty predators. As you crawl back, the feel, the heel of your hand brushes against something furred. A warm side gate grazes your cheek. You freeze in place, slowly turning your head to see what awaits behind you. Two amber eyes shine in the dark. Holy Hound himself! It's not just his herald! It's the Lord of the Hunt! Here! Yorlin drops to one knee as his hands dart around his pockets and snatch the rusted hound's head icon buried within. Your eyes, the eyes meet your gaze briefly, then turn to the sand off the clearing. The hound behind you yawns, fangs flashing. When you turn back, the lion and the bear have disappeared. In their place is a stone wolf's maw, gaping wide enough to swallow you whole. Beyond it is the outline of a temple, towering but instinct. Blood must feed the Maw Watcher. See that a true tramp champion reigns. Hey. You won't talk to me because you're Wodeka. You're. Rumorgand. Let's see what Rumorgand does. All life ends in stillness. You feel a sudden gust of cold air as if the shrine was bursting into wintry life. The frigid wind cuts through you like a sharpened blade, and the darkness encroaches upon the edges of your sight. You kneel and close your eyes. As you pray, the blackness fades to white, a howling wind fills your ears. The vision that, slows resolve, slow, that slowly resolves itself is a broad, frozen plain. See a procession of elves in the distance, periodically fading into and emerging from the whiteness. They trudge over snow banks and their heads down against driving winds. And they trek past you, one man bundled in furs, turns his head. You're headed for noon frost and the frost you reach to? Before you can answer, he's lumbered ahead. You follow the caravan and in a couple of minutes you come to a wall of ice. It disappears into the pale emptiness overhead and stretches as far as you can see in either direction. The elves stop in front of a mere smooth section that's framed like a temple door. It seems thinner than the rest of the wall. You can't see what's on the other side, but a debilitating cold emanates from within. The elves pull pickaxes and shovels from their sealskin packs and begin hacking at the smooth ice. 
their implements flying through the air in swift, shiny arcs. Though they throw their bodies into their labor, not one of them so much as scratches the polished ice. Yet with each blow, something bellows in the distance. Peter calls out to the elves, Hey, you might want to hold off on that, but that howling wind seems to swallow up his voice. The elves hack away, seemingly oblivious to the furious lowing and to the tremors under your feet. The snow has risen to your knees, the, your legs frozen in the drifts. Try to get the elves' attention? You grab the nearest elf by the shoulders, shaking her and yelling over the howling winds. You point in the direction of the booming noise, but she only scowls. Leave us, traveler. We won't, we've got to get through. We can't stay on this side any longer. You're angering something very thick. You sh you'd better stop. The elf strains to listen as she rests her pick in the mounting snow. Some of her fellows pause in her labors. The man with withered, frostbitten fingers turns. He raises his main tan and the other stopped as well. They stand motionless for several seconds before you realize they've frozen entirely. You touch the near elf nearest to you and he crumbles into a mound of snow. A final gale blows past, scattering the remains of the elves in chaotic flurry. You notice a single spiderweb crack in the smooth barrier. The only thing that mars the perfect surface of the ice. Whatever's on the other side of the strange door, you feel it tugging at you. Only when you look back do you see the parallel gashes trailing behind your legs in the snow do you realize how strong the pole is. My end comes to all things in time. Seal the frost-hewn breach and instruct the pilgrims in the patience of Remergond. Plug the hole with your finger, plug the hole with a handful of snow. You stick your finger into the snow and feel a stinging cloud. You yank your hand back, but the finger snaps off and remains wedged in the crack. A hoary rime instantly grows over the smooth surface of the frozen doorway, fusing it with the rest of the wall. A crystal of ice grows from your frozen stub. As you examine it, the vision fades around, around you fades. Your finger rises from the stump, but a shard of unmelting ice remains in your palm. Okay. Find noon frost in twelve twin elves. And my timer is about to go off. So I'm going to quickly go through the other ones. And hopefully not make the same mistake I just did earlier. Pray to Bareth, life and death, death and life. Do the same things I just did. Skull's mouth, woman. Take her hand. Man, take his hand. I'm feeling they're going to be people that have tried to cheat death somehow. Hi, Leah. I should be quick saving in case I push the wrong button somewhere. Okay, no choices there. Okay. And save. That one's fairly simple. I know where Hylia's temple is. The others are a little bit more difficult. I think there's an achievement for doing all the god missions. I don't think you have to do them all. But, yeah. Okay, saving here and ending for now. Talk to you later.